Two weeks may have passed since, but the thought of it still hurts. After nearly a decade of uptime, the online servers for Uncharted 2 and 3 were shut down on the 3rd of September. I'm aware that it will sound overly dramatic, but saying this merely marked the end of two multiplayer experiences I've put hundreds, if not thousands of hours into, would truly be selling it short. This marked the end of a decade full of memories, a forever treasure. I don't just reminisce about the iconic maps, the taunts and character banter, or the satisfying shooting mechanics. I think back to the personal experiences and all the friends I've made along the way. Even then, Uncharted 2 and 3's multiplayer modes were heavily underappreciated. Anybody who shares the insane amount of time sunk into them will tell you so. Naturally, several years of support also saw drawbacks, in the form of unbalanced features and mechanics, or updates introduced which weren't always appreciated by the community. Still, the feeling that I'm left with is one of gratitude for the endless fun it brought me and the opportunity of a lifetime that all began right here. So while we can, let's take a look back and celebrate an incredible chapter of gaming history, a piece of me and I know for a fact a piece of many of you one last time. It's hard to picture a time now where an online component for Uncharted actually did not exist yet. In order to revisit where things all began, we have to travel all the way back in time to 2009. We had just come off of Drake's Fortune, the very first installment loved by many though critiqued for the limited replay value that it offered. Initially sticking to its guns by showing one story trailer after the other, people assumed that Uncharted 2 would simply deliver a rollercoaster ride bigger in scope to answer the demand. That was until April 27th, when Naughty Dog released a first glimpse at a massive new feature to appear alongside. With the reveal of cooperative as well as competitive multiplayer modes, the main question on most people's minds was whether this addition wouldn't simply feel tacked on, and understandably so. Uncharted was looked at predominantly as a single player adventure, so if multiplayer turned out underwhelming, it would merely follow in the footsteps of other examples that started this trend so looked down upon. Therefore, a beta was meant to take these concerns away, and largely succeeded in doing so. It offered a single playlist with a few modes, maps and one co-op mission, and putting aside the odd network issues proved to be quite a lot of fun. Still, by the time of release, it was obviously Uncharted 2's campaign, which completely stole the spotlight. Many gamers would go on to try the multiplayer, but left in a hurry, with the major phenomenon that was Modern Warfare 2 knocking at the door. Still, a core community would stay on to keep playing it, growing deeply involved over time. Uncharted 2's multiplayer was embraced by fans because of two core characteristics, its basic and therefore balanced gameplay and because it felt so fresh. It brought verticality in a way no online game did at the time. Unlike the average first person shooter, which for example only allowed you to reach higher ground via staircases and ladders, here you could actually jump, swing, climb and use your physical position to your advantage. Hang on a ledge and you were able to pull your enemy down, approach them from behind without them noticing you and you could snap their neck in an instant. These small touches made for a multiplayer experience that felt like a breath of fresh air, and it sure helped that all of the maps were designed specifically to allow for these mechanics to be utilized. Uncharted 2 may have only launched with 7 competitive maps, but if you'd ask me, they've all gone at a classic status over the years. The war-torn Tibetan village, recognizable through its colored flags, the Nepalese temple with its creepy statues, the lost city of Shambhala, the icecapes, plaza, train wreck and sanctuary, each featured a drastically different environment inspired by the single-player campaign. A particular thing to note is the symmetric layout shared amongst them. All maps were essentially structured as arenas, resulting in constant player rotation around them and practically no barren spots you wouldn't ever fight on. Although this is obviously a cover-based shooter, camping was smartly discouraged by placing power weapons on a map that were crucial to gain an edge over other players. Once again, that is because Uncharted 2 shined in its basic class setup. Your loadout options were extremely limited. Every player would start out with the exact same AK-47 and a pistol. The only customization options at your disposal were the two boosters you could pick and the character skins purely for appearance. 
but if you wanted access to that powerful RPG, hammer grenade launcher, or even the auto rifle such as the FAL and M4, then navigating your way around was your sole alternative. It made the entire experience fair and competitive. No matter your rank, everybody would always start out equally, player skill being the only thing to rely upon if you wanted to perform well. As far as game modes went, none of them were really original, but some did have a unique twist. Plunder was like capture the flag, except you could actually throw the idol towards teammates, elimination added even more tension by giving you just a single life, and chain reaction always proved a struggle as teams desperately tried to capture a streak of objective zones without interruption. For a first attempt at tackling a multiplayer mode, it's honestly incredible how much Naughty Dog managed to get it right. But that being said, Uncharted 2 did have its downsides. For starters, the original server implementation restricted matches so they could oddly not be joined while in progress. More concretely, it meant that if people left your current game, you were literally stuck with the smaller lobby size. A 5v2 match could take a painfully long and boring time to complete, so as a result, Naughty Dog introduced a significant XP penalty for abandoning matches, a good idea on paper, but not always appreciated, because sometimes there are also understandable reasons to want to leave a match. The game namely contained a few bugs, some of which would happen at random, and some that players had a tendency to happily exploit. Occasionally, people would use the airwalk and glitch out of the map, they'd be able to kill every enemy from a distance while being completely invincible themselves. Reporting these cheaters was meant to get rid of them fast, but in reality, there was no escaping them every now and then. Next up, the online community would heavily complain about two boosters in particular, Situational Awareness and Revenge, though Naughty Dog never answered any of their calls. Situational awareness allowed you to see the names of all your opponents on the map, far away and even through walls, by simply standing still and hitting the up button. For a game otherwise so balanced, it felt particularly unfair, especially in Elimination, where it could ruin a thrilling 1v1 fight. Revenge on the other hand just seemed way too cheap. Upon death, an enemy would automatically drop a grenade, often resulting in your inevitable own death instead. Nevertheless, I think I speak for many others when I say we couldn't let those flaws ruin an otherwise amazing multiplayer experience. Through the months that followed, Uncharted 2 received several updates which increased the balance and added new content. However, unavoidable was that one infamous patch which changed the game entirely. Title Update 1.05, introduced 4 months after launch, completely altered your perceived amount of health by increasing weapon damage significantly. Where popular games like Call of Duty had a noticeably low time to kill, Uncharted 2 was the opposite case, something that many members of the community actually appreciated. You see, the movement system was rather slow, and climbing up a wall or running to go behind cover could take some time. This is why the relatively large amount of health was seen as a positive thing, as it allowed you just enough time to escape and with the right strategy still be able to turn around a disadvantaged fight. But clearly, Naughty Dog wanted to reach more newcomers and figured that the change could be a way to achieve this. In the process, however, they definitely pissed off a noticeably large part of the player base that had been there from the start and already loved the game's systems exactly the way they were. Almost a decade later, it remains the most controversial change that hardcore fans at the time will vividly remember with disdain. Fortunately, Naughty Dog supported the multiplayer in many good ways as well. The first ever DLC map, The Fort, was inspired by Uncharted Drake's Fortune and given out for free through a title update. Drake's Fortune obviously never included the multiplayer, so seeing some of its locations brought back in the form of multiplayer maps was more than welcome. The first ever paid DLC even added two extra maps from the first game, Flooded Ruins and The Facility. All the main areas from its campaign were now pretty much covered, one taking place in the jungle, another around the massive customs house, and the last one in the dark bunkers where Drake fights off the Spanish mutants. Uncharted 2 also included several co-op modes, which were a blast to play. Survival and Gold Rush together formed the arena playlist, but the adventure levels were the star of the show. With two friends together, you could play through portions from the single player, defending your teammate in the Nepal war zone as he'd venture off to find something to climb on, or freeing innocent people in the village and destroying a comms tower after blowing up a helicopter in the sanctuary. 
The last DLC pack added another co-op mode to the mix, Siege, which boiled down to defending specific zones, as well as two extra multiplayer maps, this time around from Uncharted 2's actual campaign, High Rise and Museum, which would become just as classic as the ones the game had launched with. Overall, the size of Uncharted 2's community may have been limited due to so many popular multiplayers at the time and the incredible single player that the world associated the franchise with, but it was undoubtedly a loyal, core community who really appreciated that what it offered was so unique. Sure, it may have relatively lacked in content and certain aspects could have used improvement, but its small scope allowed Naughty Dog to perfect most of what was there. And it came out at a perfect time too. The YouTube scene had just started taking off, introducing me to some of my first YouTubers like Broken Games HD, who I still watch to this day. I made both rivals and friends in the game myself, some would even transition from one into the other. I once met a guy in a random match on the village who, because of a misunderstanding, my ignorant 15 year old self had started to antagonize. When he suddenly turned on his mic, deservingly called me an idiot and cleared up the confusion, it left me feeling deeply embarrassed and we'd actually go on to become great friends who'd share their final moments as the servers closed last week. Ultimately, my biggest regret is in fact that I maybe didn't play it enough myself. While I managed to reach level 54 and put at least 100 hours into it, I would constantly find new single player games that demanded my attention too, while multiplayers like Modern Warfare 2 forced me to share the time I had between them. In retrospect, Uncharted 2's multiplayer honestly deserved even more of my time. Thankfully, this wasn't the end. Far from it, and knowing that a third installment was coming up, I had a lot to look forward to. With what at first seemed like a slightly out of place Krillex song choice, but is now iconic to the reveal, Uncharted 3's multiplayer was announced with an action packed trailer, highlighting every aspect Naughty Dog aimed to expand upon. It marked a step into a slightly new direction, doing away with the basic approach of Uncharted 2 in return for a beefier experience that would be looked at in both positive and negative ways. The adrenaline pumping music signified a faster pace for the multiplayer in general. I personally get the vibe that the developers had looked at the online successes of the time, of course mainly the Call of Duty franchise, and tried to integrate some of its design principles to make for a more appealing package to the mainstream gamer. For starters, a slew of new customization options were introduced, both in classes as well as characters. The basic loadout system of Uncharted 2 was gone now, replaced by a large range of weapons for you to choose as your standout starter gear. From the full auto AK or M9, to the burst fire Gmol, semi-auto 4SS and even the Dragon Sniper, every player and their preferred playstyle were now accommodated for. Rather than the predefined character skins of the previous game, each hero and villain was now fully customizable, with the craziest new taunts, hats and items, though sadly also paving the way for microtransactions which were brought later on. Furthermore, Uncharted 3 tried to carry over the cinematic approach of the campaigns to the multiplayer. Two maps, London Underground and Airstrip, featured impressive intro sequences where you'd actually fight it out on top of two moving trains as well as a plane as it prepared to take off. Although a cool idea in theory, the reality was that more often than not a significant amount of lag would damage the experience, so it didn't come as a shock seeing the addition of no intro variants for these maps later on. Speaking of that cinematic nature, the original trailer, as well as the summer beta, actually featured a small opening and closing cutscene to each match, surviving as another reminder for this desire. However, they ended up getting completely cut from the game by launch, likely because Naughty Dog figured they'd quickly become redundant after countless of matches on the same map. What did however stay were the interactive elements. As a match progressed, part of the chateau's floor would collapse by fire damage and the sandstorm would hit the desert village, limiting your sight. Much faster animations, a sprint option and zip lines allowed for even faster traversal. You could now also kick enemies hanging next to you or punch those on the opposing side of cover. Cooperation with friends was encouraged by the buddy system. You'd hand out high fives and pick up each other's treasures for extra points. Akin to the kill streaks in Call of Duty, Uncharted 3 featured so-called kickbacks, which would be unlocked after acquiring a certain amount of in-game medals. You could spawn an RPG out of nowhere, become a near-invincible juggernaut for 15 seconds, or even transform into a swarm of spiders that could creep up on enemies at rapid speed.
Many players greeted these kickbacks happily, but for others, the rewards Uncharted 3 would sometimes offer towards the less skilled players became too much of an annoyance. For example, power plays were now also a thing. If your enemy was drastically behind in points, they'd gain an advantage for a short time to help them catch up. The initial marked man phase would only be frustrating for whoever fell victim to it, but becoming exposed through walls to all your enemies and even giving them double damage to easily kill you in later phases of the match proved way unfair. Essentially, players were punished for being skilled, while plainly said, the noobs ended up getting rewarded for it. It sure didn't help that Uncharted 3 already included tools, specifically designed for these people. One of the main weapons was the Cal 7, a gun absolutely impossible to aim with because of shaky recoil, but purely meant for blind firing at short distances and being heavily overpowered at that thanks to high rate of fire. Meanwhile, the game also had major balancing issues. It seemed like every other day a patch would come out nerfing one gun, only crowning another as the next undisputed king for the entire community to turn towards. Revenge was as idiotic a booster as ever, serving as the cause for team kills even more than actual enemy deaths to much frustration. Together with the friend I already mentioned, on days where we had a bad mood, we actually made it our personal quest to banish people using it from our lobbies by purposefully walking into their grenades a few times so we could kick them from the game and I kid you not, make montages out of it for YouTube. It truly signified some of the issues that diehard fans like me, as well as the greater core community, faced regarding the unfairness of it all. The same Broken Games HD, whose Uncharted 2 videos I so enjoyed, made a now iconic video breaking his Uncharted 3 disc because he couldn't handle the unbalanced mechanics anymore. And you know, I totally understood the frustration, but at the same time, personally I couldn't let it stop me from nonetheless enjoying the game greatly for what it did do well. It was just an incredibly fun game to play for me. I also respected how much support Uncharted 3 received from Naughty Dog to keep the player base active this time around. Not only did we get 5 entirely new maps, all 12 maps from the second game were brought back and remastered, each one of them featuring a unique new theme. The train wreck, previously covered in snow, and honestly somewhat of a chore to play on due to hindering your vision too much, now found itself situated within the Rubalkali Desert. Flooded ruins became molten ruins, now affected by extreme volcanic activity. The lab game mode would bring a unique new concept every so often, like a sniper pistole playlist or dodgeball, where you try to kill your opponents by throwing grenades at them from a large distance. Most of these experimental game types took place on a wide range of block mesh maps, which were work in progress map ideas that never made the cut to the retail game. At the time we even speculated if these possibly hinted towards Uncharted 4's locations, but obviously that ended up not being the case. The support went on for so long that even on Uncharted 3's second anniversary, mind you, after The Last of Us had already dropped and the PS4 was right around the corner, Naughty Dog released its final map, Dry Docks, based on the one shown off in the original multiplayer reveal trailer, but that fans had wondered for years about what had happened to it. As a thank you for all of the fans' dedication, they saw their one remaining question answered at last. Uncharted 3 also featured a brand new co-op adventure mode, bringing 5 total levels at launch and one where you played as the villains later on, in some awesome locations set across all three of the original games. A mini storyline with an increased amount of cutscenes, even more witty dialogue enhancing the experience and exclusive co-op loadouts asking for extra strategy and communication made it an awesome challenge trying to get the exclusive co-op store next to your name for beating them all on crushing difficulty. In 2013, the online portion became free to play for anyone who owned a PS3. As a result, and maybe therefore all the more puzzling to understand the recent decision, it's been easy to find lobbies in both games until the very last day. But in the end, I'd be remiss not to talk about what Uncharted 3's multiplayer did for me on a personal level. 
Obviously, it kickstarted my YouTube channel with the top 10 plays. Up until this point, I was nothing but an unknown yet giant fan of the games. I'd begun recording my own commentaries, discussing new changes that I liked or disliked simply by speaking into an iPod and using the game's cinema mode for gameplay. What's up everybody, this is Robin with my third commentary video on my YouTube channel and um, it's uh, a new video of mine because it's about uh, Uncharted 3. It was a time without worries, the kind of time where if a friend and I ran into a new rival online, we'd decide to make a montage out of killing him just for our own amusement. But as an avid player, I looked at Uncharted TV, seeing several countdown series and feeling like there was something they all deeply lacked. I wanted to make my own show that celebrated Uncharted in a way the others didn't already do. With the amazing original music and visual graphics in style with the franchise. Looking back at the first episode may be a bit painful now, as I had barely any experience editing videos at this point. But against all my expectations, I managed to get in contact with Naughty Dog, who decided to feature me in the game itself. Within a single day, a dozen new subscribers had come in and I started to receive clips on the PlayStation Network that people would send in to me. Had it not been for the top 10 plays and for the chance I was given by two former employees at the studio, you probably wouldn't be watching this very video right now. I made montages like Karma and Connected, both have over 100,000 views on YouTube and I still read new comments on a monthly basis from people returning to it to be reminded once more of those good old days. And I also made many more new friends. Together with George from the Legacy Archive, we'd go over the latest patches, always ending on a ton of bloopers we made throughout. The icing on the cake remains the prank call, where we fooled a young kid who had stalked my Skype for hours and we just couldn't keep in our laughter. What's That's pretty good, Robin. Have you been uh, have you been applying the quick tips, which uh, we showed you in our video? Yes, yes, yes. I definitely like, um, you know, the, the wank and roll. <laughs> Did you just say wank and roll or whack and roll? That's probably not entirely appropriate for this kind of conversation, Robin. You said wank and roll! No, I said, I said whack and roll. Now seen as a key pillar within the Uncharted scene, I even had the opportunity to interview Naughty Dog's community manager at the time, who shared details and upcoming plans and helped me further establish myself within the YouTube scene. With the next generation of consoles right around the corner and Uncharted 3 now over two years old, I decided it was time to broaden my coverage, leaving behind an amazing time in gaming that's been simply unforgettable. And I think that's the thing. The world has moved on, it already had for a while. When the news reached us that Uncharted 2 and 3's servers would be closing, an explosive impact was bound to be absent because of how much time since these days has passed. But me personally, I realized that more than ever, I've never truly said goodbye. I may be 7 years older, I may have built out my YouTube audience and expanded the range of games I play, but I know my history and in my head I'm still the same teenager who spent hours and hours playing that one addictive multiplayer game long into the night until the reality of school the next day eventually struck my mind. And even then, when I should have paid attention to the words spoken by my teacher, my focus slipped off to the game because I couldn't wait to return. There just are no other words to describe it, it sucks. With the closing of these servers, a phase of my life has also concluded, frankly ripped away from me because I never asked for it to. In spite of that, my sincerest gratitude goes out to Naughty Dog, to the developers responsible for allowing me to keep these precious memories. The memories that, even though the games may not be accessible anymore, can never be taken away from me. But sadly, this is where the road ends. No more satisfying kill sounds after kicking someone off a ledge. No more pumping over enemy bodies following a 5 not alive. And no more Harry Flynn shouting incoming in his hilarious signature way. A chapter has come to an end.